Hello, this is Emma from Real Life Ghost Stories, obviously, and this isn't an ad, I promise. A few weeks ago, we were contacted by Sammy from Out of the Woods Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation. Sammy saw that there was a need for licensed rehabilitators in the Memphis area of Tennessee and set about creating Out of the Woods Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation. This autumn, the centre will open and take in squirrels, raccoons, foxes, opossums, cryptids, and some species of birds. It costs around $250 to rehabilitate a baby raccoon and get them strong and fit enough to be released back into the wild. And unfortunately, there is little to no governmental assistance for projects such as this. We'll be donating money to Out of the Woods Wildlife, and if you have the means or desire to donate money, you can too. Each person that donates to the GoFundMe in the month of August will have the chance to win Real Life Ghost Stories merchandise of their choice, and we'll pick five winners at random. It doesn't matter how big or small your donation is, because every little helps, and you still get an equal chance to win some merchandise. We know that it's a difficult time financially for lots of people. So like always, there's no pressure to donate. But if you still want to help out, liking, following and sharing on social media is also a meaningful way to help small projects grow. Go and follow at Out of the Woods Wildlife on Instagram and check out outofthewoodswildlife.org for links to the GoFundMe and any information that you could want or need. The links for everything will be in the description of each episode of 30 Days of Terror and I'll be playing this little message every five episodes or so. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to day one of 30 Days of Terror. How you do? I'm so excited. I'm quite excited actually, even though I know I'm going to be terrified for a month. But I, I am, I'm excited, but I am also quite concerned about the mammoth task we have ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, I do feel like we might have, it's, it's that case of going to the buffet and filling up your plate when you probably shouldn't, isn't it? Eyes bigger than your belly, mm, that kind of thing. Yep. No, we've got this, we could do this, definitely. Okay, yep. I've got some stories for you today. Ooh. Ooh, I don't exciting. even know what noise that was. It sounded a bit like a wolf or a werewolf. Ooh, I can't even do it. My vo- there's, there is a range in my voice that's no longer there. Oh. I wonder where that's from. Just, I don't know. Excessive Finally hit terror. puberty. Have you hit puberty? <laughs> Congratulations. How exciting. So story number one today comes from Chris. Are you ready? Never ready. I should start out by saying that I do, to an extent, believe in the paranormal. Although I'm very sceptical of most other things, such as vampires, Bigfoot, etc. It all just seems like nonsense. I'm the type of person who struggles to believe something unless I've seen it myself, or I know the source is from a 100% genuine person. Anyway, so my first couple of stories are, I would say, alien related. I can remember years ago, maybe going back to the late 90s, early noughties, me and my siblings were watching a Halloween episode of The Simpsons. It was late in the evening and my dad was working over at our neighbour's house, about a five minute walk from our house. We live out in the countryside. Anyway, my dad calls my mum and tells her that there are these lights at the bottom of our neighbour's lane and for mum to take us over to see it. I remember walking over the road in the dark with our mum and seeing this circular object in the sky. It was big, but if you held up your hand, you could block it out. Anyway, it was just sitting way up in the sky above my neighbour's lane, and it seemed like it was rotating on the spot. I don't know how to describe this, but it had different panelled sections around the circle shape that were lighting up alternately. Like three would light up and then go off. And then another three would light up and then go off. So it's kind of like it was spinning around, if that makes sense. It was also the stereotypical glow-in-the-dark, bright, whitey, greeny colour. 
I remember all of us, there was about 10 of us, were kind of in awe of it and we asked our parents what it was. They weren't sure, but they could see that some of us were a little freaked out. So they said that it was a laser light show coming from our nearby town for Halloween. (laughs) I do not recall there ever being a laser light show then or even now in our town. Anyway, we kind of watched it for a while and it just stayed there. And eventually we walked home and that was that. I'm assuming we went to bed or something. Nothing exciting, sorry. It wasn't scary at all. Just my first ever experience of something that was really weird. Jump forward to around 2016. I was asleep in my room. My cousin was sleeping over. And my sister and I are the only two that sleep upstairs in my house. But she was away. So my cousin was asleep in her room. Our rooms upstairs have those skylight windows on the roof. One in my room, one in my sister's room, one in the hall connecting the two rooms and one in the bathroom. I woke up to go to the toilet. It was still night time, but I'm assuming it was around 4 or 5 a.m. As you could see, it was starting to become morning. As I was walking out of my room into the bathroom, I heard a little sound on the roof. So I just looked up towards the skylight window in the hall. And there... At the bottom left-hand corner of the window was a face looking in. Oh. When I say face, it was more just the outlined shape of a head I recognised. And on reflection, I felt like I saw some sort of a hand too. I also swore I could make out eyes as there were two shinier circles on this black thing's head. Its head was fairly human-like in shape. I froze when I saw it. I'm one of these people who will freeze and you'll always say, well, why would you just stand there? But I was so confused. The thing then moved really quickly back from the window and I could hear it move over the roof to the skylight in my room and then it just stopped. It moved fast. Faster than I could if I was on my roof in the dark. I then ran to my sister's room and woke up my cousin and made him come over to my room and sleep in there as I was terrified. I told him about it and then he couldn't sleep afterwards. We've since gotten little blinds to slide down the skylight windows. For ages afterwards I tried to convince myself that I saw a bird or something. But I know the shape of a human head when I see one. My next story is to do with what I think is sleep paralysis. This first one happened about three years ago. I was sleeping with my head under my pillow, stomach flat to the bed. I don't know the time, but I remember waking up and not being able to move and panicking. I remember trying to call my sister, but all I could make were grunting sounds. It was then that I realised there was a man on the bed beside me. I have a double bed. He was on the other side and his head was under the pillow too, facing me. He just stared at me. I didn't feel scared. I felt weirdly calm. He was a white man with facial hair and long brown hair. He just stared at me and put his finger up to his lips as though telling me to be quiet. Then I closed my eyes and imagined that I would wake up. What I saw next terrified me. The man was gone. But standing beside my bed was a figure with inhumanly long, tall, black, spiky legs. I could only see up as far as its waist, as my head was under the pillow. On reflection, the legs almost looked like a child's drawing, and they were really spiky at the sides. I closed my eyes again, and began to say the Hail Mary, and wiggle my toes and fingers, as I had heard that that helps you wake up when you have sleep paralysis. I woke up and everything was back to normal, I was terrified and confused for a while as it was my first time having sleep paralysis and I was so scared. I turned on the TV in my room and watched it for the rest of the night, refusing to go back asleep. I'm not massively religious, born and raised a Catholic but don't practice much. But since then, I always sleep with a little cross on my bed. Nothing much really happened with sleep paralysis for a couple of years. I still had it a few times, but never saw anything, just couldn't move. But could always hear some loud sound like a fan or something when I had it. That all changed about two weeks ago. 
It's only me that sleeps upstairs now. My sister moved in with her fiancé at the start of 2019. So since then, it's just been me. Anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night, and what I saw at the wardrobe door in my room terrified me. It also happened to be standing right under the attic door in my room. It was this extremely tall, slim, black figure. But it wasn't spiky, like the last one. It was so tall that it had to hunch over to avoid hitting the roof. And it was wearing the most bizarre clothes. It had a floral head wrap that a little old granny would wear. It had no obvious facial features. It almost looked like a person would if they had black tights pulled over their head. I could see where eyes and a mouth were meant to be, but they weren't well defined. It was also wearing a blue fleece and a long floral granny skirt. Its two black arms and hands were reached out in front of it and it was wiggling its fingers together in a really menacing way. I wasn't sure if this was sleep paralysis or a dream or what, because I could move. When I woke up, I was obviously facing upwards, but I positioned myself back around so my head was facing the bed and away from this thing. I could only move really slowly, so it took a while to turn around. When I had turned around, I felt something sit on the side of my bed. I was terrified. And then I woke up and everything was normal. I was so freaked out and went downstairs and slept in our sitting room. This thing seemed so similar to the other thing that I'd saw the last time. Both were tall, black, slim... I have no idea what it was, but I convinced myself that it was just a dream. Well, that that alien story made me want to die. Yeah, running across the roof. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a really common description of um, flying saucers. That's a really archaic term, isn't it? Yeah, UFOs. Um, UFOs. To have that those alternating panels. Like, There's quite a few corroborating stories where they're described like that. Um, and I love the parents. Oh, yeah, the Halloween light show. Yeah. <laughs> I also love the fact that they were obviously, they obviously saw it and went, oh, me, this is mental. Get the kids. Yeah. They'd want to have a look at this. Because <laughs> yeah. I would probably do the same yeah, thing, to be honest. Come and have a look, Bim. <laughs> Come on, Bimmy, let's go look at some aliens. But if I saw something running across the roof, Ooh. do you know what? I'd have to, I'd have to be put down there and then because I, would, I wouldn't be able to handle yeah. it. You know the final story that Chris told about sleep paralysis, the really tall granny. Yeah, that sounds like an alien to me. It's like because it's almost as if they're like, right, we need to look human. We need to fit in somehow. Yeah, and they're just like, well, these I've seen this, I've seen this humanoid wearing a, I've seen these humans wearing these clothes, but not understood the concept of like clothes. who wears those clothes. Do you know what or I mean? Fashion. It's like a, yeah, and it's like we'll we'll fit in perfectly. I think there's a, a similar scene in, I want to say Captain Marvel, when the the Kree first come to Earth where they're trying to fit in and they do something not quite right. It's those sort of telltale signs where you, you, you know that. Like the Uncanny Valley where you're yeah. just like, something's not quite yeah. right about this. So Chris, just to let you know, it's aliens. It's I all mean, aliens. Majorly not right in this case because this is a, just a giant thing in Granny Close. <laughs> And story number two comes from Natalie. Hello, tiny Bims and her human minions. (laughs) I left that in because I loved it. (laughs) I thought you might be interested in this story my dad told me from his childhood. At the end of the 1950s, my dad lived with his family on an Air Force base in Shanghai. His parents were not particularly attentive and he and his siblings ran wild and were often out exploring until late at night even though his oldest sibling was only 12 and my dad was 8 or 9. They thought they were rough and tough Air Force brats, so they thought nothing of it at the time. One night, they got bored of their local haunts and decided to explore the old prisoner of war camp at Changi, where the occupying Japanese forces had kept Australian prisoners in the last year of the Second World War. The way my dad tells it, it was pitch black, and they were sneaking through a break in the fence when they heard the echoing sound of many, many footsteps. They ducked down in the undergrowth and peeked out into the darkness, 
only to see a troop of marching Japanese soldiers viciously driving emaciated prisoners into the camp towards them and shouting words the children couldn't understand as they didn't speak Japanese. Terrified, they stayed as still as they could out of sight as the soldiers approached and began to march past their hiding place. In horror, my dad, uncle and aunts watched as the soldiers and prisoners' feet passed inches from them, all the while leaving the weeds and stones in their path completely undisturbed and even visibly passing through larger clumps. Despite their insubstantial form, the figures seemed to show up as if they were lit by a light that wasn't there, and he could see that the prisoners were ragged and many bearing clear signs of beatings. Within a few minutes, the apparition had passed them by, and the children scrambled back through the broken fence and ran all the way home. I don't know if they told their parents about it, but my dad described it as horrific. He reminded me that he was only a child, and they had heard about what happened at Changi, so maybe it could be explained away as a shared hallucination. Who knows? Whatever it was, his face telling me this story showed that it left my dad haunted in one way or another. I think stuff like that must happen, though. And it's like... residual, yeah? So I'd imagine a prisoner of war camp has got some energy to it. Oh, definitely. And if and I'd imagine war zones have energy to it as well. So I'd imagine occupying forces, yeah, residual energy, ter- terrifying. As a child as well, really terrifying because I'd imagine part of you's like acknowledging the fact that it's quite ghost- ghostly, but the other part of you is like, I'm somewhere I shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> and there's all these people. <laughs> oh God, we're going to get caught. Because <laughs> yeah. as a child, <laughs> you always have that irrational fear of your parents. Yep. More so than anything yeah. else. Getting in trouble is Absolutely. the big thing yeah. when you're a child. It's like the night marches in Hawaii, right? Right. Mm. Hmm. So our next story comes from Amanda. I'm somewhere between a sceptic and a believer in the paranormal. I've grown up having odd things happen. But I will tell you two of my favourite stories. You should know that by favourite I mean the ones that creep me out the most. The first of my stories was actually told to me by my mum. I don't remember much from when I was four, but I do remember my imaginary friend, Jake. He stayed with me until I was about nine. He's important to the story. I was born in the lower part of New York. My family lived in an apartment until I was four. When I was about two, I started to climb out of my crib at night. My mum would often find me in the room, sitting on the floor playing. It happened often enough that my mom got rid of the crib and moved me to a twin bed so there was no risk of me falling. On some of these nights I would go to my parents' room and tell her that Jake was thirsty. Just before my fifth birthday, my mother woke up to see what she thought was my very blonde head at the end of the bed. She went to ask what I needed and felt like she couldn't breathe. She says it felt as though something was pressing down on her chest, pinning her to the bed. She frantically started slapping my father until he woke up, at which point the weight lifted. My parents then watched what my mom thought was me at the footbed, fly across the room and out the window. My mother said it was the most terrified she had ever been, and the only time she can remember my father actually screaming in fright. The next morning she asked me if I had been in her room, to which I responded, No, no. Jake was scared because the light was in your room. My parents were already planning to move to northern New York to be closer to my father's family at that point, and my mother was more than happy to leave after that night. In the new house, I continued to play with Jake at night. There were parts of that house that I wouldn't go into, simply because Jake said I shouldn't. Jake was always my protector, and if he was imaginary, or something more, I'm not sure but he kept me safe. As I said before, Jake was gone around the time I was nine, at which time my aunt had her first of two miscarriages before carrying a third pregnancy to term and having my cousin Jacob. Every single psychic my aunt has met has told her that Jacob is an old soul, and whether or not it's true, it has always struck me as odd. 
My second story is probably the worst string of nightmares I've ever experienced. A little over a year ago, I awoke from a nightmare gasping for air and drenched in sweat. I often have quite vivid dreams and nightmares, sometimes waking from even a good dream with happy tears in my eyes. But I usually don't remember the majority of the dream. For four nights, I had almost the same nightmare. When I would wake in the morning, I remembered every single detail of the dream, right down to their black eyes. Prior to these dreams, I had never heard of black-eyed children or any other black-eyed being. You can imagine how freaked out I was when these dreams began. Each night, there was a small difference in the dream. So I must retell each of the first three. So I apologise if this is long. On the first night, in the nightmare, I was in my car driving through the town I grew up in and the entire town was decorated in fall festival setting. As I drove through town, I noticed the lights in the old Flanagan Hotel were out. If this had been reality, I would never have found this strange because the hotel had had a fire before I was even born and had remained boarded up and untouched while I was growing up. In my nightmare, however, I slowed down in front of the hotel and pulled over. As I sat there staring up at it, a woman got in the back seat of my car. I started to say, I'm not a car service, as I was turning to face her. When I looked at this woman with pale white skin and inky black hair, I found myself staring into jet black eyes. The only way I can describe her eyes is that they resembled a well of black calligraphy ink. I recoiled from her. She asked if I would take her somewhere. I sat, staring, feeling sick and hot. I told her to get out of my car. I couldn't take her anywhere. She pointed a long, bone-thin finger at my front windshield. I reluctantly looked. When I turned back around, she was gone. But I was left listening to maniacal laughter. I woke up in a panic, launching myself straight up, gasping and terrified. The next night, I had the same nightmare. Except instead of a hotel, it was the gazebo near the town library I pulled up to, noticing an overblown decoration. As I sat staring, she climbed into my car again, but into my front seat this time. Again, I was staring into those black eyes. She pointed out my window. I turned, looked, and the laughter began again. I awoke once again, sweating and panicked. The nightmare the third night was, for me, the worst. This time, I am driving through a town that is somehow a combination of the one I grew up in and the one I moved to at 16. As I'm driving, I hear my son talking in the back seat and look into the rearview mirror. The woman is there, staring at me, sitting next to his car seat. I slam the brakes and pull to the side of the road. I scream as loudly as I can. You cannot be here. Get away from us now. I reach into the back seat, across the woman's lap, all while staring into the blackness and open her door. I repeat, you cannot be here, get out! She grabs my arm and starts pulling me out of the car, across the front seat, into the back, towards the door. I just start screaming, get out, over and over. Just before she pulls me out of the car, I wake up. My husband is holding my arms and telling me to calm down. Apparently, I had been hitting him in my sleep. This nightmare had me completely shaken. When I awoke that night, it was around 2.30 in the morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. I went to work at 8.45 and it was all I could think about. I googled almost all day long. I looked through pages and pages of stories about black-eyed children, but I found nothing like the woman in my dream. I went to the library and bookstore after work in hopes of finding anything. When I couldn't find anything, I called my sister. I told her the entire three-night ordeal, and she said I should probably stop drinking coffee before bed. She said she was going to the library and she would ask her friend, the librarian, if she'd come across anything like that in any books. That evening, she called me and told me that while she was talking to her librarian friend, 
another friend whom was apparently a psychic, told my sister that I moved the woman away from the Buddha in my house. I told my sister this lady was crazy because I don't have a Buddha in my house. She asked if I had something like a Buddha, to which I said no. That night, because I was exhausted, I took a muscle relaxer in the hopes that I wouldn't have a nightmare. I had another dream, but it was quite similar to the first, not as terrifying as the third, but enough to lead me to what I did the next day. It was my day off, so after putting my children on the bus, I went back inside and started tearing apart my house. I went through every single room in the house looking for a Buddha or anything similar. I was sure I didn't have anything like it. I went through the bathroom, kitchen, living room and kids rooms, even going through the toy bins. I started tearing apart my own room and I'm halfway through when I look up into the mirror and see the reflection of my window. And sitting on the ledge is a Buddha. I immediately called my husband to ask him when and how we acquired this Buddha. I will admit here and now that I do not pay much attention to the small details. He said it came with the sand garden that my son had gotten for Christmas the year before. I then asked him if it had always been in the window and if so had there been something next to it. Seriously I'm so oblivious. He said yes and that the small doll my mom had given me from when she lived in Germany had been there, but our son had taken it down to play with a few days earlier. At this point, I hadn't told him anything my sister had said. I asked where the doll was, and he said I had to ask our son. I didn't have that kind of patience. After four nights of barely sleeping, I returned to the living room and our son's room searching. I couldn't find it. When our son got home, I asked him about the doll, trying to be as nice as I could, because if my son thinks he's in trouble, he completely shuts down and stops talking. The doll was in his sister's desk, as he was playing with her with it. I promptly returned the doll to the window, hoping for the best, but not really believing that this was even a real thing. That night, I slept peacefully and told my husband the entire thing the next morning. He joked and said he was going to move the doll the next time I annoyed him. He doesn't believe in anything paranormal. But quite honestly, I wasn't sure that this was the cause and resolve of the dreams. A few nightmare-free days later, he joked that he was going to move it. And so I did what any rational person would do and superglued it to the ledge. (laughs) I haven't had the dream since. That was over a year ago and I still get freaked out when I think about it. When Emma told her story about the black-eyed woman, I couldn't believe that someone else had seen what I had seen in my dream. It's nice, in an odd way, to know that I'm not alone. It's not nice. It's horrible. It's a doll. It's a doll that is seeping into your dreams and is clearly having some kind of sordid relationship with a Buddha. Yeah, very odd. Very odd behaviour from a Buddha and a doll. And I see your rationality of gluing it that's such new energy i i would take a match to it but yeah i also get the oblivion though like yeah. of, of not noticing things i don't yeah. notice anything no i know that's why the I was smiling the world could fall all down around me <laughs> and i wouldn't notice so i i do like you don't need to explain yourself i do genuinely understand that something would have been there for a long time and you just won't have noticed it i i'm fully on board with that yeah jacob's an interesting character as well isn't he <laughs> oh jake at least he, he did seem like he was looking out for it. Yeah, at least it? he's pretty sound. But he's... I want to know what the light was that came into the parents' room and flew out the window. Flew Fuck out that. the window. It just, I've flew. Just had, I've just had enough. Do you know what? Day out one of window. 30 days of terror. And I've had enough already. Flew out the window. If you enjoyed this week's episode. No, not this week's. Today's. Because we're going to be yeah. back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Please make sure that you... Check out our website. Check out our website, which is reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. If you want to follow us, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We have a super group on Facebook where you can come and chat all things paranormal to people. You can support us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for $5 a month, you get 
extra access to loads of bonus episodes and similarly for two dollars a month you get the complete back catalogue of 50p movie club all of the links to everything that you need are in the description of every single episode so if you want to find something you can find it there and on that note we shall see you tomorrow bye